Meet Brian Murphy, one of America's most accomplished and adventuresome architects. Brian, you began your university studies as an art major at UCLA. Did you want to be a painter or a sculptor? And then I found out you wanted to be an art historian. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, yeah, I, actually, my, my, I was more of an art historian, you know, if, if anything. And I then, as I sort of dabbled around in, in the sphere, um, it became apparent to me, like I had said earlier, that the art historians en masse seem to be to the manner born. And, and at the time, at UCLA, the architecture school was not accredited. It was just this experimental you know, um, uh, indulgence of the regents. And, um, and they never accredit a school when it first opens. It's, um, so as a result, they had this great cadre of faculty staff down there, very creative group. And I found myself going down there because it was just so wild. They were doing all these amazing things. And so I was very much romanced by what I was seeing there, though little did I know that that was really not a very uh, accurate bellwether to <laughs> the practice of architecture and whatnot, which I found out later. Sometimes you're called a designer, and sometimes you're called an architect. Please clarify this. What's the what in your mind is the difference, or are you both? Oh yeah, I mean, I I don't see any reason to limit oneself by saying that you're an architect. I mean, I mean, if you want to design salt and pepper shakers, I'm happy to go there, or a pair of high heels, or or graphics, whatever it is. I mean, it's all design, mm -hmm. and to be able to to look at, you know, a project and say, I'm just going to design the building, you know, why not the outside and, and address, you know, the interior, interior mm -hmm. design. I mean, there's, I mean, it's, it's so integrally, I mean, they're, it's all together. And some people have said, you know, I'm a design Rasputin, you know, but, you know, I just assume to it, I, I, I like what I do, you know. Joseph Giovannini once called you a California Fauvist. Now, fauve literally means wild beast, and the fauve movement in art was based on the premise of working in totally different ways and going against all rules. Do you think you break rules? Mm. Um, you know, I mean, they say you know they're there to be broken or whatever. I mean, not consciously. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because like, what's a uh, an existence predicated on negation. I mean, I mean that's. I mean, it's much better to sort of stand for something than define yourself by what you're not. I mean, it's a lot easier to to be safe and say, well, that's no good, and that's no good, and that's no good. But it takes somebody to step out and say, this is what I'm doing. This is where I'm going. Um, and so. I don't know that just for the sake of breaking rules that we're going there, but sometimes it's fun to sort of tap dance and dance with that and and show maybe by example you teach you know and if if in so doing you 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 use a material that heretofore has been you know used for chicken coops and and you design a project where you've added a wing onto a house. And this literally is a true story. And these people said, well, how long will this last? And I said, well, 15 years. And they said, well, that's OK. In 15, because they had this joie de vie. And they looked at that and said, OK, well, in 15 years, we get to reclad the house. We get to you know, revisit this process. And plus, it was inexpensive. You know, I also like it to be physically responsible. I don't like to waste people's money. I like it. It's much more wonderful to sort of um, uh, work on a really low budget. I mean, it's, it's nice to have projects with a lot of money, but a case in point, a fellow came and he wanted us to do a, oh, a production company. And he told me he wanted to do his build up for $10 a square foot. And I said to him, I said, Frank, I am not afraid of your budget as long as you pay my fee. And that your mother-in-law may not recognize this building as comfortable domesticity, but 
I, I, to me, it's a challenge. It's, it'll be stimulating. And we did do this project, and it ended up being $15 a square foot, and that included three or four bathrooms, a kitchen, a new roof. Um, we went on eBay, bought all this mid-century modern furniture for the lobby for 10 cents on the dollar, bead blasted everything down to raw metal, powder painted everything beige. So you had Charles and Ray Eames, you had Bertoya, you had Cernan, you had Mies van der Rohe, all in beige, on a beige carpet, and that was the lobby, all done for $15 a square foot. You know, And see, to me, if you're a production company in advertising, you're nothing if you're not creative. I mean, what do you sell? That's all you've got. And I knew that his competition were plopping a pair of binoculars out in front of their building or spending upwards of $500 a square foot. You want to spend like 15 now. And, but, so you can do it. And once again, that teaching by example, when people come in and see this, they say, oh my god. And they look at that clamp light chandelier or this thing. And, and they say, I mean, that's a $3 light fixture. But it's a brilliant fixture, and it's gimbal mounted, and it's flexible, and you can slide it up and down, and it's on skateboard wheels, and it rolls, and it's got an extra convenience out outlet on it, so you can plug other stuff into it. And when people come in, it's so cute. There were some kids in here like a weekend ago, a couple weeks ago, and they walked in and they saw those clamp lights, one to another, to another, to another, to another, and they just went, "Oh my God!" I mean. And, and see, that's where they're shifting gears. They're doing that vertical transfer and saying, and it's almost free. There's no cost inherent in any of this. It's just how you look at resources and problem solving. What were the strangest materials you've ever used? Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, that's a question. We built an inflatable building one time, and put a, a water base ring like a like a, a water bed just as a tube to anchor it. And that was when I was in school. Everybody else was designing the project was to design this ethnic arts museum for this campus. And I decided to build my building, not just design it. And so I got a heat sealer and got these people to donate this PVC. I built this huge structure out of plastic with this water ring so that when everybody else was talking about their drawings about the building, I brought them to my building. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in third world countries, there's a, they say that there's, I'm not well traveled, but they say that there's a lot less trash because trash is a resource. I mean, what did Bucky Fuller say that like, you know, pollution is just untapped resources, you know, and it kind of, and with that sensibility, you look at the environment. I mean, look at these red bricks that I pick up running on the beach. Everybody else walks right by them, you know. But to me, it's there's there's it's I, I find the fact that there's continuity in it. There's an aesthetic dimension there. They're soft when bricks are, you know, iconically they're angular, modulated, you know, building materials. And then it's like you're picking up this man-made flotsam off the shore, and then <coughs> sort of celebrating it yet again. I mean, so, I mean, it's, it's how one sort of approaches materials and that sensibility. Is it true that you designed your former office in Venice by throwing the I Ching? Oh, I did, And actually. what resulted from that famous oh, that was, throw? That was really fun. I, because somebody was coming like the next day to photograph it, and this I had, I, I was pretty young at the time, and I don't think anybody had ever come to photograph anything, and so I thought, what the hell, I'm going to throw the I Ching. So I threw the coins and got the, the hexagram or whatever it was, and I wrote it down, and then I looked it up, and the hexagram read something to the effect go halfway. Something about ascending and go halfway. So what I did is I snapped a line down the middle of the floor 
and painted half the floor. I painted it white and then took a black roller and just rolled these big stripes over half of it. And, and everything I did was just sort of just half, you know. Um, I, I'm much more drawn to the sort of ad hoc design solutions, people taking materials out of context, people who out of necessity have to design for um, for their you know specific needs mm -hmm. and find solutions to those needs you know in their backyard I mean or in the alley I mean when I look and see I mean there was a NPR came around and they were looking, somebody had written a book about defensive architecture, which I sort of reject. I mean, I sort of don't like the idea of being defensive anyway. But I said to this person, and I liked her a lot, I said that, well, I mean, anybody, I mean, with a budget can do port and place concrete or and have a defensive, you know, environment, you know. But I said, what I would rather do, why don't we go and drive to the ghetto and see how people there design for a more troubled environment, where because everybody's so paranoid, okay? And it was really interesting to do that, because we went and we saw how people in high crime neighborhoods, they plant bougainvillea, paracanthia, um, these are plant materials with big stilettos in here, rose bushes. Um, I saw one solution was brilliant. They took a chain link fence and there was a, a date palm next door. The date palms, when they dry, are these tapered, razor sharp stilettos. I mean, the little knives. That they thatched those palm fronds to their chain link fence, and you couldn't climb over it. And the chain link fence was only this high. The palm fronds were 10 feet high, but they just tied them on, and it was just brilliant. And so, the, to me, I get so much more out of that kind of problem solving, people sort of going there than going to Getty Land or something like that. I just, I, you know, and I'm not discounting that, but I'm just saying, to me, um, that kind of problem solving is, uh, you know, infinitely more creative, you know, which is sort of what I get out of. You work a lot on the computer. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite software? Which one do you use more well, often? We're using this Autodesk 3.3 right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not, I mean, I I can certainly navigate through all this, and I, I use the, my computer mostly, um, I hate to say it, but just to track uh, projects. You and do? You work by hand? On, yeah, I, I'll work anyway, I mean, yeah. but other people can plot CAD faster than I can, though I can do it. And, we like to 3D model projects and whatnot, but I'm. This is a whole other sort of philosophical point that, like, I'm I'm in the business to do build buildings, and I really have an antipathy for this sort of mannerist, sort of high art process celebrated. I mean, that drawings are collectible. I mean, I just don't even want to go there. I mean, drawings are a vehicle to build a building. So, for what it, where I'm coming from, and and models and all that are just trying to get me from A to B to build that building, and so I don't do anything, or I try not to do anything extraneous like that, and it's just about getting us through the regulatory agencies so that these buildings can get up, because that's the cheap, that's the the most financially expeditious way. Do you have a favorite Brian Murphy project, or are there many favorites? You know, I don't really. Um, I mean, certain ones maybe. Um, there's stories involved, and they, they're all just sort of different. And, um, you know, 
the ones maybe that that push and teach, I think, like I said, that should sort of show that, you know, that a Spartan budget can still be stimulating and dynamic. This is Lionel Railroad track uh. that is um, tied in, so it's literally track lighting, yeah. and we gimbal mounted these um, low so voltage lights. <laughs> it's sort of fun. You've got one Persian rug, one sort of, sort of, <laughs> New Empire sort of sofa with Imperial B silk fabric, some of the most expensive fabric and in the world. And then the aluminum chairs. Yeah, but everything else mm. is like, you know, a tree stump mm -hmm. for a coffee table. That's a great idea. And then it's just a piece of glass. And then you, you take a cardboard template, take it to the glass mm. shop, and they'll cut it for you for next to nothing. I finally found this little house, an accent on little. This house, I, it was so small that we just decided to just make it bereft of articulation. So everything was white. I mean, we painted the white, the floors white. I even, I was so nuts about it that I, I would come home at night and caulk the baseboards to take the shadows out because I wanted it just literally just seamless. And, and it pretty much worked. I mean, look at this. I mean, this tiny little house, but there's no articulation, you see. I even put a white fin in the surfboard that's sitting overhead that has white clamp lights because I sprayed them white so that everything was just sort of passive. The idea here was that, that by reflecting and creating the shaded uh, patio cover, más <coughs> um, that a lot of the sort of insulation from the sun because like my first day on this site it was like 114 degrees and to me that's like life-threatening um, but I'm not a big fan of air conditioning either so so this was like a passive solution to this heat gain problem and they say that it has to be over a hundred degrees for three days in a row before they turn on the air conditioning in that house because it's 20 degrees cooler they say underneath this roof but yet we did put big integral skylights into it so that we could pull light back down into the, the space. Yeah, we did this building. Okay, this is and, Dennis Hopper. Right. Uh, and and the, this program was just trying to address prim primarily just how he, you know, needed a space in which to show his art work. Once again, it's like, it's all about trying to find ways in which to show art. And those the stump yeah. tables, and, you know, this metal box fireplace with a glass sort of hearth. That's Marcel Duchamp right there. Mm -hmm. and, and then this warped roof, which is just kind of exciting sort of mm -hmm. space in which to be. This largest dimension of this building is 32 feet by 16 feet. But it's five stories. There's actually a basement that cuts away. So it's one, two, three, four, and a mezzanine, five stories gangways running into the house for every floor so that you park over here and you wander down the hillside trail and pick your point of entrance and, and launch into the house. This is kind of neat, isn't it? Yeah. We just took, trimmed the trees, made the table, burnt a couple of the logs and raked them down How the wall. How incredible. It's because we didn't have any budget for art, so <laughs> <laughs> that was sort of... This is a pool light in a shower, ah. rabbited glass into the ceiling and the floor. Great Every idea. surface is tile. There's ah. a traffic mirror. The gate valves come out of the ceiling, feed this little feeder. And this is a salad mixing bowl, and the trap is in the slab. Ah! All glued together. Yeah. We made our own hinges. Now, this house, mind you, is, is pretty graphic, and I mean, in terms of eye candy, it has a lot sort of going for and it has a beautiful view and the pool and this you know but um, they say that whenever they have a party that everybody hangs out in the powder room because <laughs> they all they're all gawking at this stupid sink which is just a slab of stainless with the chevron welded onto it with a hole in the back for a drain pretty pretty neat though fabulous Actually, the story behind that is really kind of neat because the the client, this very sort of wonderful, compulsive, minimalist director, and who 
had such a penchant for the clean aesthetic and he's got three little kids one of them in diapers so it's hard to be a minimalist with little kids all over the place but he insisted and he had an, a, a really nice stainless sink and he wanted to know if we could work this thing into his powder room I swear to God I worked on this for months and the project was under construction and it was getting finished and we still hadn't resolved this sink thing and I kept trying to work with his existing sink and sending drawings back and forth and he would send we would it was, I could see by the faxes coming back into the office that it was like two or three in the morning and he was fixating on this thing. And, and finally, out of total exasperation, I sent him this caricature of a bucket on a stump and said, well, how about this? And he fired back, I like it. <laughs>